In August of 2016, I moved to New Hampshire for the Free State Project. In my year there, uh, the experiences I had destroyed me. I was annihilated and reborn many times. In the six months that I dedicated to transmutation and meditation practices, I found that that profoundly impacted my intrinsic strength and ability to handle what became the worst situation of my adult life. It is in this transformation that I came to a fundamental understanding of what, for what kinds of skills and priorities and values that free staters fundamentally need for this movement to be successful. In fall of 2016, my first three months there, um, I lived and worked on a really bizarre farm that was isolated from society. I, um, by choice, was homeless in a town I'd never been to for two weeks and um, constantly challenged myself to push to my physical and mental limits. All of this being thrown at me all at once led to the most profound realization of truth that I've ever had. In 2016, I had a disillusioned experience, what some people might call an ego death. If you want to understand what disillusion is, well, keep watching this video. Also, uh, read the book When Things Fall Apart by Pema Chodron. Uh, then in spring, I, I got into selling high-quality kratom uh, because I discovered the opioid epidemic in Manchester. I volunteered at a local recovery community center, and I really started gaining a lot of traction with customers and community and connections through word of mouth. This was really a huge untapped demand, and it was a noble goal. In June in 2017, uh, the beginning of summer, I moved into a free state house. Right after I moved in is when this huge conflict erupted, and I was targeted as the core of this conflict, and ultimately it was based on lies and rumors and an incomplete story. I was verbally harassed and ultimately outcasted from my own home, and so I just disconnected from that situation. My now ex-girlfriend left the movement and I moved back to my home state of Minnesota and here I am today making this video after a brutally tough recovery. There's a couple of prominent subdivisions in the Free State Project. The first one is that um, the Free State Project has a divide between political and non-political participants. One of the most established parts of the Free State Project are from this core group of early movers that frequent Manchester and a lot of them happen to be very politically involved. The level of political involvement that I saw in my time there was really one of the most disappointing facets. You know, I don't, I don't believe the best or only way to achieve my goals is through the government. I consider that to be a core statist belief. And unfortunately, that belief was held more persistently and intensely in uh, these political free staters than anywhere else I'd seen in, in my life. To me, it just looks like a lot of people who don't know how to become independent of the state and are trying to figure it out. And ultimately, this is a really good thing if you can recognize the Free State Project is an experiment. If only more people could recognize, like, more consciously how much of an experiment it is, then they might not get so hooked into the state. Um, so the other rift that I want to talk about in the FSP, it's the spectrum of normalcy to weirdness in the movement. The banning of Ian Freeman exemplifies this. I think it's a really good um, example of the conflict that can happen on certain different ends of the normalcy and weirdness spectrum. When Ian Freeman was banned, the normies in the FSP, normies, didn't want the controversial publicity that he brought to the movement. And, but I would argue that his weirdness was integral to his leadership. I relate to this personally. As a long-term natural outcast myself, I believe that outcasts must be leaders to make sense of their outlier nature and transform it into something useful and positive. A weird person who is supported and given the space and acceptance to grow and do as they need will flourish and be a source of innovation in society. But a weird person who is outcasted, if others really can't accept them or can't find ways to support them, this weird person can become a very deeply tortured person, um, very isolated and sometimes in tragic cases that means they could become a threat to themselves or others. The FSP movement doesn't know how to handle outliers, and this is a huge problem because 
uh, the libertarian values of the free state movement are outlier values in greater society. The people attracted to the free state project feel outcasted in their own world that they were born into, that they didn't choose. A society and civilization that is entangled almost imperceptibly with statism and authoritarian structures and very the roots of past authoritarian culture. I'm one of those outlying weird people. I have overcome a lot of my personal issues, but I've met a lot of people who were just as weird as me in different ways that were suffering so much personally that they outcasted me. When a person is suffering, they can get trapped in the illusion that we are all very separate and distant. I am fundamentally not alone in being an outcast. Outcasting is not this one-way street, it's mutual. If you outcast me, then you're rejecting yourself from me too. Recognizing that we all feel separate is the first step in recognizing you are not alone. As spring turned into summer in my situation and everything just exploded, I started to really see how different my values were from those of the free staters in my vicinity. So the values that were espoused most often in my vicinity of people I interacted with were uh, entrepreneurship, understanding of economics, action over theory, loyalty to the movement, and the non-aggression principle. I could appreciate and empathize with many of these values, and I had overlap with them in my own versions of um, those values, which gave opportunity for building bridges and connections, but it became surface level beyond my close friends because I didn't see people going deeper into the human part of that philosophy. It's the values that I believe are fundamental to the success of this kind of movement. My core values start with autonomy and active investment in relationships. The two basic needs I see as the foundation of all relationships are safety and respect. To meet everyone's need for safety, we actively participate in building trust. A lack of trust building was a huge contributor to the perceived iso uh, isolation and conflict in my conflicts in the house and around me. And to meet everyone's basic need for respect, we set boundaries and use negotiation instead of manipulation. The simplest way to respect another's autonomy is to take ownership of your autonomy. This includes taking ownership of your suffering and internal reactions. No external experience causes your suffering. Other people in external situations have no power to control your internal reactions. Only you have that power, so you're responsible. Participating in consistent observation can help in separating the external situation from your internal reaction. Observation comes from consciousness and consciousness is the origin of autonomy. That's probably the most important sentence I'll ever say in my life. Consciousness is the origin of autonomy. So if you're observing external, internal, external, internal, and you can define yourself, then you can take ownership of that. Sometimes people will be nice and polite to disguise their obligations or demands, but nobody is obligated to do anything. That is the core of autonomy, and this is Im heavily and directly implied in the non-aggression principle. An attempt at shaming is kind of like the other side of this coin. Shame is an internal emotion a person has or feels. Trying to externally make them feel that way is trying to force them to feel some way. Shame reinforces actions because it is deterministic. The accusation that a person is inherently bad and doesn't have autonomy. Take this quote, we live in a world where most people still subscribe to the belief that shame is a good tool for keeping people in line. Not only is this wrong, but it's dangerous. Shame is highly correlated with addiction, violence, aggression, depression, eating disorders, and bullying. That's from Brene Brown and her book, Daring Greatly. The best indicator of how you will deal with conflict with others is how you deal with conflict within yourself. So the ethical and boundary setting principles that I've talked about that I believe are lacking in the FSP is because um, so many people did not prepare themselves for the challenges and adaptations that the movement requires. 
This movement is one of the most important experiments in human history, and I saw far too many movers who did not understand or recognize the magnitude of what the movement was asking of them. You have to be a dandelion with roots in the sand coming up through cracks in the concrete in this desolate world, unrelenting, confronting your own internal suffering, your own evil, must happen before any peace can happen out in the world. Right after ego death, I got a job in a call center and I was biking in winter in New Hampshire. And in the midst of this experience, I coincidentally also discovered uh, the Wim Hof series of breathing methods. And one of the methods that I used from him um, hyper oxygenates your body and in a short period of time. And it uses cold air specifically. It takes in that cold air and it triggers and normally involuntary mechanism of the sympathetic nervous system that helps you deal with stress and minimize cortisol and deal with high intensity situations in a productive way. I'm not only getting physically better and more in tune with reality as it is, I was also mentally confronted with the present moment. That feeling where you're hit with like this dead wall on every side, bam, 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 and there's no escape whatsoever. And so you just sink into the present moment. A big fundamental key to peace is the quality of your being. And when I was confronted with this, I improved the quality of my being without getting hooked into action. And sometimes if you're about to do something that would make things worse, to stop causing harm and just let go, having that skill and that ability and that wisdom is one of the most noble peaceful and profound actions you can take is being, non-action. In chemistry, transmutation is taking one element and transforming it into another element. And the path to foundational inner peace, transmutation is taking suffering and transmuting it into peace. Chaos and transforming it into understanding. Confusion into clarity. The first step in transmutation is to recognize what is. So if you don't observe, then you can never see that you are gripping life tightly in fear of loss and death. You won't ever have the opportunity to relax and let go. The moment you see that gripping and the moment you feel its fundamental pain is the moment you begin to wake up on the path of inner peace. Orient yourself on a path to foundational inner peace and become the alchemist. If you want to transmute the state into the market someday, start with your inner state first. So I hit my breakthrough on my lifelong goals in a way that gives balance and clarity to decades of my life and allows me to achieve multiple goals and gives me the opportunity to work on it every day. The resource that provided my internal laser-focused direction comes from Dr. Jordan Peterson's concept of the highest conceivable good. To quote, Life is suffering. There's malevolence in the world. There's tragedy. If you're not properly oriented with regards to life, the fact that it's full of suffering will bend and twist you until you become murderous and resentful. You have to learn how to strengthen yourself as an individual so you can bear the burden of being without becoming corrupt. You have to decide that is what you're aiming for. To wish on a star is to aim at the highest conceivable good. So I wasn't a dandelion coming up through the concrete when I first moved. I did not fit the criteria until after ego death in my first three months there. But I was ready for the adaptation itself, as evidenced by the ego death and all the skills I built rapidly thereafter. And so if you do that research on what skills to build and show, okay, here's who I am, where I am, how I live, compared to how it's going to be out there, and here are maybe some of the gaps I need to cover, and then take that adaptation as a challenge, as an opportunity for transformation. So don't look for perfection. That's a terrible goal. You deserve better than perfection. You deserve the opportunity to live out the truest form of who you are. That means being completely transparent and leaning into suffering, into failure, 
into the fundamentals of reality. But some people who aren't ready for the movement, or even meant for it, ultimately jump at the opportunity in hopes the Free State Project will give them a better life, or will provide them with this um, flourishing community of fellow libertarians with shared values and um, a natural connection socially and will get along and they won't be so alone or isolated. The FSP is not going to make your state-free desires easier by default, especially if you don't really understand how to live those state-free desires, if it hasn't been invented or explored at depth yet. Don't expect the FSP to give you that better life. Expect yourself to give the FSP a better world. New England is a very rural area north of Boston, and so being independent from the state and just in general means taking on a lot of work and resource management to be self-sufficient. The people that I saw adapting the best were homesteaders, and then also their labor contractors, or the people who are in that field to support these homesteaders and farmers in that economy. When I first heard about the Free State Project in early 2013, I knew immediately that I was going to move and participate. My immediate thought was, wow, there's actually a movement where people are living out their principles and, and striving to be independent of the state. It's real, it's happening. Um, but that's a low standard. And embedded in this low standard for me was the assumption that the people moving are going to be of the highest quality advocates, participants, and uh, leaders. And that's a tall assumption. So this combined low standard with high assumption turned out to com be completely wrong. The FSP is full of authoritarian and statist roots and imprints in the individuals, leftover, residual. These people didn't come from state-free societies. I mean, we all came from very state-embedded societies. We were born of it and into it. And we're all just trying to figure out how to heal from that violation of autonomy and to live autonomously. A free stater is not automatically more independent of the state or wiser in the right decisions and capable of making those hard decisions. The deciding factor though of whether a person is ready for the free state project or even meant for it comes down to your own introspective reflection and preparation, including knowing what kinds of sacrifices you're willing to make for the movement. It's about bearing the burden of being without becoming corrupt or face the real possibility of being destroyed.